Walking outdoors or from life puts you in direct contact with the life force. Not just the light and the landscape, but also the vitality of the world around you. Artist George Carlson. This is The Artful Painter, art lessons for artists, collectors, and people who love art. Lynn Schmiel has no interest in merely copying what he sees. He says that he allows his intuition to speak. Its intention is to expand the boundaries of realism rather than merely painting a facsimile. While many artists lament having artist block or a lack of inspirational ideas, Lynn is not one of them. He is keenly interested in all that is around him and the possibilities that they present. He says that there is more than a lifetime of ideas awaiting his easel. He does not let others dictate what he should paint. Rather, he paints what interests him. Now, Lynn first appeared in episode 12 of The Artful Painter. I knew in having that first conversation with him that there was still so much more to his story and his experience. In this conversation, Lynn shares his thoughts on the importance of knowing who you are as an artist. He discusses the importance of doing a mental reset when observing familiar things so that you see them with a fresh eye. He dwells into the importance of experimentation and trying new things in order to grow as an artist. Lynn's entries into the 48th Annual Prix de West Invitational Art Exhibition and Cell clearly demonstrate his virtuosity in developing new ideas in a painting. His three entries are a diverse range of subjects. One painting features scrub jays breakfasting on rose hips on a spent wild rose bush near his home. Another painting shows aspens aglow with sunlight above a cool mountain stream. And another depicts lily pads calmly floating on the surface of a pond basking in the sun. These diverse, gorgeous paintings by Lynn Schmiel make it clear he is intent on making each his own. My name is Carl Olson, and this is The Artful Painter. Well, I think the last time we spoke, I, I know we, we, we talked about gardening, how it inspires uh, optimism, perseverance, and you also uh, talked about the importance of concept at that time, which was really, that was, that was a nice conversation. I, I, I really appreciated that. What I never got into, you do everything. You know, a lot of yeah. artists, they, they just want to do the paint. They don't care about the frames. They don't care about the photography and blah, blah, blah. I kind of like the idea that you're kind of that guy that does a little bit of everything. So I thought that would be cool to talk about. And, you know, you know, I was just thinking as you're speaking about the, uh, the concept, when I started, uh, when I left uh, commercial art, let me say, uh, everybody was always talking about, uh, where I worked at Hughes aircraft, I left the art department at Hughes aircraft to become a commercial artist. And, and they would talk about artists, you know, saying, well, you know, uh, you gotta, you gotta find your niche, and, you know, and you keep doing stuff until you find your niche and just, just keep painting it. And I heard that also in a different context when I was actually, uh, you know, began painting for myself after my career as a, as a commercial artist. And I went, well, I, I like everything. You know, there's, a, I, you know, I'm excited about lots of visual, different visual, uh, seeing the excitement it's just everything it, there's something exciting about just about everything you can see with your eyes as far as I'm concerned so I am not going to look for a niche my niche is going to be don't expect to see the same thing twice and again and yes I paint a lot of water I've done a ton of snow scenes but I don't think you can point to any one of them and say that's just like the last one and because I look for different things I look for compositions I look for you know stuff in my garden to paint I, you know, I paint whatever it is that that goes through my mind I have a a piece on the, in the, um, the pre-west that is wildlife 
which I don't do very often. It's a bunch of scrub jays, which I have locally. They're kind of a pest in a way because they get into my fruit and things like that, but they're really neat birds. It's like a blue jay? Well, they're like blue jays, except they're, they're, they're not quite as solitary, I guess, because the families, like I have a couple of them that are just hanging around. The other three or four from the new nesting has moved on. I don't know where they are, but... But they're still they're still around. But they're similar birds, but they're they have different habits a little bit, and they don't sound the same. Anyway, so I was just down in the bottom of the ravine last winter, or was it winter before? Yeah, it was winter before last. I was just wandering around there at the break of dawn or before dawn, and and um, just had the iPhone with me, and I walking around down there. It was frosty and in fall, like November. And I came upon this wild rose bush that was down there, and I went, well, that's the color was great. It's kind of this auburn color, and along with all of the the dead grasses and scrub growth and some juniper trees and cedar trees and so forth. And I get that thought in my mind. Took two or three shots of it with the iPhone, and then I kept going back to it over and over for about a year, and. First, I thought, God, it's really cool to to emphasize the uh, the rose hips on on that bush, and it was going to be all about the bush. The the, uh, the deer had eaten on it, you know, had been browsing on it for quite some time, and uh, years and years. It was an old rose, God knows how long, you know, but probably thirty years. Is it like a wild rose? Right. Yeah. And and they're all over the place out here. Uh, they can handle pretty dry conditions and so forth. So so. Um, I, you know, as I went along, I thought, well, you know, we get mountain bluebirds, and mountain bluebirds are they're here all year, and they're really in kind of a turquoisey blue, and just lovely. And I went, you know, I thought about that. I was going to put mountain bluebirds in it, and I went, well, as I thought about it, they're pretty small, and if I put them in there, in into the the distance that I wanted the the, the rose bush to be at. They're just going to be little blue spots. And so the blue jays are about at least two and a half, three times the size. I mean, the uh, scrub jays. So I started thinking about that. And I went, yeah, I'm going to do it with scrub jays. Well, just at, at that time, I had scrub jay family around here just going all over the place. And I started taking the occasional shot, but they were not very good. And and I also have a have a friend, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to have to do a lot of research to come up with this scrub jay scrap on the web and wherever and bird books and, and invent things out of, you know, just draw them and the things that I want. Well, I have a friend who's wildlife, well, she's, she's a photographer, but she loves taking photographs of birds and she has very fine camera equipment and she also has an immaculate eye. She's just really good. So I told her about my, my blue jay thing, she, or my scrub jay thing, and she says, well, my feeder, they're all over my feeder out here. And she lives about 20 miles away from here. So she sent me about 100 shots wow. of scrub jays flying in, flying out, upside down, standing on top of things and everything. I've been, my God, I got a whole dictionary or an encyclopedia of scrub jays now. So I got to work those into the um, into the painting and in thank Julia for it. Uh, even on my little, uh, thing on Facebook, I think which for providing the pics for the, for the, uh, uh, the reference for those J's. And, and, uh, it, it was really neat. I sent her, I did say send her one drawing of this one J that I wanted to have in the foreground, looking down at the bush, like, man, this is somewhere I'm going. And she sent me one, Facing the wrong direction, everything. So I had to redraw it and everything, but it was it was almost perfect. So I didn't have to do much oh. to it, and it, it yeah, it all just worked out. She she just waited until she got just the right shot, and and um, just shot them through the through her dining room window at the bird feeder. So that's cool. I think so. that's that's also. I just found the painting as you were talking about it. So it's called oh, okay Scrub Jay's Breakfast Menu Rose Hips. Yep. That's the one you're talking yep. about. Uh-huh. Oil uh-huh. and canvas, thirty-two by thirty-seven inches. Yeah, that is that. It's a beautiful painting, and and the birds, the, well, thank the you. yeah, the bluish tint kind of has a nice contrast with the the uh, burnt orange of the of the old uh, rose bush that's fading out, and 
it it is very different. Right. So so last year, let's see, I forgot what that one was called. I think it was called Lost in Space. I think it was the one that we talked oh, yeah. about. Uh-huh. That was a pre to West yeah. entry. So that's a this uh, stark landscape, um, blue flowers in the foreground, uh, billowing clouds, and a very different type of painting. I I think there's uh, there's a, a certain amount of bravery in doing this, doing something totally. Totally different. I see what you're well, talking about with niches because, you know, I guess you could niche it down and say, I'm just doing coastals. I'm just doing mountains. I'm doing, mm-hmm. uh, you know, countryside scenes, uh, nostalgia. I don't know. I don't know what you could. There's all kinds of things. I guess you could niche it down. But doing something different, that really pushes the boundaries. Yeah, it's not my worldview. Uh, there's just too much exciting stuff out there to be stuck in one category as far as I'm concerned. And I get excited about just about everything that goes through my eyeballs. But that started with a, that started with a little hike down in, in a ravine. Yeah. Yep. Just off the, just below my studio. In fact, it's uh, down a hillside. It's about a hundred feet deep. And, uh, the, uh, south facing side is completely desert like because it gets this fierce sun. And there's only some small, uh, small growth vegetation on that. It's almost just pure rocks and, and uh, well, I can't even call it soil. I think it's been so burned out of carbon. It's just dirt. And um, and on the the side that faces north, which is the way my studio is oriented, it's covered with um, there's there's the roses there's um, there's a wall of pear that some bird dropped the seed from and grew into a tree there's there's just all sorts of plant life and grasses meal and thread grass there's I mean there's just all sorts of vegetation on because it, the snow lasts longer and it's just a little wetter and it doesn't have that sun beating down on it all year long like that south facing uh, side of the ravine does so just those differences are just nifty i i enjoyed seeing those things and making compositions out of them in my head and you know so i was just wandering around down there and it's boggy down there it's where we that's where our spring is there's cattails and and oh. you know, some wild apple trees and and uh, and some dead cottonwoods. There was a family of beaver down there, but the neighbor didn't like the you know messing up his pond, so we had those eliminated somehow. And and uh, so you know, but but still in all, it's it's really nice uh, down there. I enjoy being down there. How would someone fight the danger of becoming formulaic in painting? Well, first of all, you have to want to avoid it, and you know, it takes all kinds of personalities. There are people that really want to nail down what they want to nail down, and, and I have no objection or criticism of that idea. I'm just doing what I want to do. You know, one thing we were talking about, the concept thing, is for us, especially for people, I think, that are starting out trying to figure out what inspires them. You know, one of the things that I think is important is to try to figure out for yourself who you are and then do it who you are because there's a lot of folks that when they're starting up particularly and I'm sure I did it I, you know my brain is so dang old at this point that I can't even remember that but I can remember paintings I did long 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 time ago because I still have a few of them around to remind me but it's to have a continuity uh, to your work. Um, even though I changed the way I paint certain pictures, certain paintings, uh, that Scrub J piece has more detail in it, more drawing and precise drawing in it than a lot of the work that I do, which is more open and more about brushwork and maybe a bit more about patterns and design. But I, I accommodate the subject and sort of had a communication with it about, you know, how does how it, there's a communication going back and forth. Like, what is this thing? What do I need to do in my head to communicate what I'm seeing out there that makes it my own? And so getting started on having that continuity of thought there, like, who am I? 
and then painting that person. You know, who you are, what matters to you. If it matters to you that you want to just keep painting five rocks on the sidewalk, that's great. You're going to really be good at it by the end of your life. But if more things than that interest you, that's fine too. And that's where I am. You know, there's all this stuff to be interested in. And each one of them is a challenge. You, know, you learn new things when you paint new things. When I was doing that Scrub Jay piece, I didn't really look that closely at the habits of Scrub Jays till I started thinking about putting them in that painting. And then I started watching them more intently in my yard. Uh, when they come in and <laughs> start attacking the fruit, you know, for instance, or, or trying to get into the chicken pen, and, you know, and they were, what they did and how they did it. And they come in and sometimes they just glide in from long distance and swoop in. They'll stand upside down, pecking at the, ear, the ears of dry corn I have at the end fall. And I've noticed them before, but I really started paying attention to their habits. So when Julia sent me these shots, I could I could see what they were doing, you know, and I went, okay, here's what I need to do to to build that painting with these with these scrub jays in it, and I had the reference for it. I, I had to modify some of it. But that's that's what painters do, right? Yeah, hopefully, yeah, yeah. I mean, as I say, I don't I don't have anything against somebody just wanting to explore one subject and really do it well. I mean, that's great. Uh, it's not, it's just not my way of doing things. So, Well, I, I, and I guess that's the lesson is uh, knowing yourself and doing what you, you enjoy. Each person does bring a different personality, a different approach, a different set of interests to it. Yeah. Just, just you paint the stuff that interests you instead of the, instead of, or maybe that, that you want to paint to learn something about instead of saying, uh, I wonder what the current ism is and then copying it. That to me is not very artistically <laughs> thoughtful. I, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't go along with, uh, with the way I think. And, you know, I, I've said this in every class I've ever taught and, and in lectures and everything. I see, I see nature as organized chaos. And that's the way I see my life. Uh, I, I'm... I have more things that I'm interested in. Uh, I have way too many tools for everything I'm interested in, <laughs> <laughs> which makes for a lot of stuff. My daughter came over then said once, and she said, I know what she meant, but she says, my God, what am I going to do with all of this stuff? And she meant after I croaked. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I have... I have a lot of stuff to get rid of. And I said, make a great big pile of everything you can't use and put a match to it. So don't even worry about it. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, this appeals to me though, Lynn, because one thing I've, I've worried about, because I have had people say I should kind of look specialize in one thing or just paint what's around me. And, and I've come to grips. I think I'm slowly coming to grips with it. I, I want to paint different things. I like, I, I have different interests. There's different things I want to paint. Some may be still lives. Some may be something outside in my backyard. Or it may be an epic Western, <laughs> which I do love the West, even though I didn't grow up there. I don't live there. And I've only visited it occasionally, but it's just uh, epically inspiring to me when I go out there. And there's other parts of the world that inspire me. I've been to, I was, yeah. since we last talked, my wife and I, we went with some friends. We stayed on this tiny little island called Samos. It's about a mile and a half, two miles from Turkey. And then there's, there's very few tourists there. It's, it's, it's just the Greek people. And, and it was uh -huh. just, it was an amazing experience. I, I, I did a ton of, Photos and sketches and things like that. I didn't paint there because it was not practical to do. But, but I, I, there's a lot of things there I want to to paint from there. That that gives me a thought, though. Uh, you know, when you visit a place like that you've never been before, you, uh, you you're bringing fresh eyes and a fresh impression of, yeah. of the place. Something 
something that somebody that has lived there for a long time certainly wouldn't see or probably sees every day and thinks nothing of it. And, and that goes, and, and this is, was my thought, um, is I, I'm quite familiar with my surroundings here now after living here for 20 years and I see different things, but now than I did before, just because of that freshness has worn out. However, I'm aware of bringing a fresh eye to a new place. So, you know, before the virus thing, when I was actually driving around still, (laughs) but I still do it here in, in my own, in my own space, around in my garden, the hillsides and, and so forth. I try to imagine coming on what I'm looking at, just happen to be out walking around, you know, threading my way through some sagebrush or something and try to imagine this is the first time I've done this. And I immediately start noticing different things. I stop, you know, I slow down. I look this way and look that way. It's, it's, it's really um, an interesting exercise to do that because you know, the clean hair in the grocery store is something you've done 150 times or whatever in the car. Driving to the uh, to the grocery store and slowing down, going from 50 to 30 miles an hour and looking around as if it was the first time you're seeing this, even though you've traveled it time after time. It's a lot of fun because it, it changes brain waves or something it just it gives you a different perspective on where you live a mental reset almost yeah it is a mental reset it's yeah. saying I'm, br- I'm brand new here what happens when I'm brand new here and you, you see things differently but you also have the experience of having been there for all these years so you know it much more intimately subconsciously you know the details you know the seasons now you know where and all of the experience that you've gathered that you have with this fresh insight of looking at it as if it's brand new. Whereas if somebody that is brand new comes, they don't know all that intimacy. They don't have that experience with it. So they, they'll see the superficial stuff. But when you've lived there for a while, you'll see the superficial stuff if you bring new eyes to it but you'll also have this this detailed intimacy with it that's, that I find is really it's really fun to do for me and, and it's like the, the painting with the jays in it you know I've been down there before I've never really paid attention to that rose bush it's another one of those rose bushes but the atmosphere conditions and so I changed the hillside behind it because it didn't compose well uh, but it was too dark and it was too complicated, and so and, you know, and I fussed with all of that stuff as every painter does. So you simplify it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So it, yeah, that's that's cool. Oh, and one one little thing about that. Uh, speaking of the composition of that, there's a. Uh, do you have that up on your yes, screen? Yes, I've got it up right now. Yeah. See that that opening through that wall of trees in the background? That kind of slot on the left side. Yes. That's very. With a jay that's flying. Yeah, the it. jay looks like it's looking back toward the, the rose bush right. and is going to fly and, right back to it. Yeah. Put your finger over that jay and so that you can't see that jay. And that, I sat there and looked at that for weeks. I tried any combination of color and rich, deader, you know, grayer. And I, my eye just kept going through that slot. But I felt like I needed to have that slot that is an to add to the volume of the painting, the depth of the painting. And I'm from, I'm sitting there going, what am I going to do about that? I can't, I can't call this done until I 
do something with it. And I started going back through the thoughts that Julia had sent me. <laughs> I found that one flying. It was flying the other direction. And I just flipped it because the light was completely, you know. And I went, there's the perfect solution. I plunked that little bugger in there, and now you can't, You the volume is still there. Yeah, and see, now that I've seen it, if I take it out, I can't but see the, it. the bird turns you right back in. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you were so, to take that bird out, <laughs> yep. you'd say, oh, something's missing. And then you then you you take your finger off of it. And there it is. Right. It, it just it it perfectly balances it out. Wow. There's 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 something more to composition than just a bunch of flat elements. You know, it's a thoughtful process, or should be. And man, my my thoughts were screwed up on that. I just did not know what to do. I I thought I had exhausted every avenue to to fix in that space, and I didn't want to eliminate it. And that bird thought came into my head, and there it was. So how did you feel about that? I mean, that had to have been a good feeling to to solve that. Oh problem. yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are those are those are the challenges. If you keep painting the same thing over and over again, are you learning anything new? And one of the things that I want to do with my work is experiment, even on a small scale, with every painting. It can be a new color or trying to flip a color for. You know, you know that, that that bush is a certain color this time of the year, but I, I don't care. I want to make it a different color so that it works in my painting better. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be a big deal. But if you're not experimenting and challenging yourself, you're just not learning. <laughs> right. if, if you're trying to do is fit into your peer group, you know, when you you know, just so that you won't look bad, like, you know, like, well, that didn't work, and God, this is a dumb painting. I don't care. If, if if I've learned something for it, it can be the dumbest painting I've ever done, and there can be 50 people around watching me doing it, and I won't care. So That's liberating. It is liberating. You know, nobody can do, no, can, no one can have my thought processes. You can all learn to handle a brush better than I do, um, but you don't have my thought processes, and that's what it's all about for me. I'm kind of selfish that way. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where the art's made, right? It's in your head. Well, I don't know. I don't know what art is. I, oh. so that's the hardest one. You know, the, the, uh, it brings the thought, this is the... the uh, you know, people wonder about inspiration and what you do for inspiration when you don't feel inspired. And I say, I don't have that problem. And people that I relate to don't have that problem either. The, the list of things that I would like to paint, and I have a list. I have a list with drawings of ideas for maybe uh, an on-the-spotter that I've done that I want to expand on or something like that. That that bunch of eight and a half by eleven pages gets thicker every year. Um, I mean, I, I I could not leave this place and just work on on things that I've wanted to do for years and years and years, and probably paint for the rest of my life. Um, but new things keep coming along. It's like that blue that scrub jay piece. I you know that just kind of appeared. So right. I've heard people say, uh, you know, the blank canvas, the fear of the blank canvas. Or, yeah. and not, artist oh, block. That's what it's called. Artist block. That's you know, it. Writer's, writer's block, artist block, you know, walk around the block. I don't know. Do something. I had a design teacher uh, when I was going to night school at Art Center, work at Houston, going to night school there, and um, the advertising design guy was. Uh, Really good, really thoughtful. Guy okay, said, "You know, you got a canvas on the easel in front of you. If you keep staring at the canvas, you don't. You don't have anything to relate to. It. Just make a mark on it. Everything will relate to that first mark, and at least it's a start. And looking at a blank canvas, wondering what you're going to do with it, is no way to start. There's no concept to that. If I think about it, you know." Put something on it. Just put what you had for breakfast on it. (laughs) (laughs) 
draw a Cheerios. <laughs> yeah, yeah, why not? You know? <laughs> My granddaughter calls it the, be- she calls it a beautiful oops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so it's funny how kids' minds think, but um, that's what she yeah. she called it. She said, call it a beautiful oops. Just put it on there and then see what you can turn it into. So, okay, honey. Sure. It's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's really gotten good, interested good in enough. her. Yeah. Good. She's about 10 years old and uh, I want to get her a French easel or something. She's wanting an easel. She's really been... Uh-huh. Pouring her heart into it. And I thought, oh, wow. This is great. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. One of my granddaughters is too. Yeah. So. yeah. Oh, wow. How, how old is she? Yeah. She's uh, just turned 11 a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And she's just drawing, she's just filling sketch pads. That's uh, awesome. There's three of them in, in that family. She's the middle one. And she is just filling sketch pads with things. And she's really... <laughs> I'm going, holy cow, I wish I had that good when I was 11. Boy, I don't wonder where I'd be now. So, well, <laughs> well, me too. It's fun. fun yeah. to see, so. Maybe I wouldn't be getting such a, a late start as an old guy doing this. <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's all a beginning. That's right. So. That's right. So, so you mentioned sketchbooks. Do you do you keep sketchbooks? Is that something? You know, I, I don't draw as much as I used to. Yeah. Um, I just don't, I, and I love to draw, and drawing is the thing that pulls you out of, a, of a messing around and putting mindless dabs on a canvas when you don't know what to do. It's it's generally, uh, in my experience, that the drawing has gone wrong somewhere, right. and drawing is really, really important if it gets out of drawing, and I mean drawing in a broad sense, I don't mean just drawing as in with a with a piece of buckle or something. Right, right. Uh, drawing, drawing as in design. For me, it, it includes color if it's the wrong color. I mean, it's, it generally means that if you're drawing a barn and you, you don't know what feels wrong about it, it's the drawing. For some reason, you know, I was thinking of this just now, for some reason, people think it has to be kind of an earth shattering painting, every single one of them. And if you're not an earth shattering person, (laughs) how are you going to do that? (laughs) I know I'm not. So, uh, you know, just do, do what interests you. It's, it's liberating. But there is a point and I don't know how this, I don't know how to define this. There's this thing, this uh, of quality that just seems to make a painting work, and and it can be very elusive. And I guess that's what uh, maybe as we're learning, we're trying to we're trying to get to that plateau. <laughs> well, it's not a plateau. It's like a, you're you're climbing this infinitely high mountain to try to get to that point where somebody can look at it and say, "Wow, that's a good painting." <laughs> a lot of it. I believe is first, first of all, paying attention. You know, we were talking about that earlier with driving down the road and so forth. Yeah. Bringing an eye to it, but really taking a look at things. Obviously mileage makes a big difference. Sure. You have to paint a lot to be comfortable with whatever your chosen medium is. And if you really want to have fun, switch mediums. (laughs) There you go. Uh, if you really want a challenge, I should have said no. Have you done that? that? You know, that it, it, it goes on. Oh, sure. But, you know, basically, I used to paint watercolors on uh, when I first started painting out on the spot. Wow. And I found that, you know, if you get in a little shower, you got little drops of water all over you. you know, it, it, Ooh, it's watercolors are kind of a hassle. Yeah, on the, on the, you know, right. <laughs> Happy accidents. Oh, boy. No, yeah, no. Nope. That's what watercolor is. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I don't mean that in the derogatory sense at all because yeah. it requires a great deal of skill and drawing. Um, I think it's a, be- and I do think it's a beautiful medium. I love all the different oh, mediums. God. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I pretty much settled on oil because they're handy all the time. They don't dry out all of a sudden and, and rather than acrylics, which is what I used to use as an illustrator and designer. So the oil painting is really versatile. Um, 
So, yeah, and I, there's the texture, which I love too. So, and uh, I thought for a long time that I would do sculpture and I just never had gotten around to it because gardening gets in the way. And the other things I do with my life. That's your sculpture right there. Well, it's the truth. Yeah. Uh, so there's only so many things that I, I divert my attention. I won't, you know, capable of storing to divert my attention from from um, doing my sort of artistic endeavor. Uh, endeavor. So, um, so I'm sticking with oil. Yeah, that's that's it. And drawing. I still draw. It's, it's not not to take that away, but it's not drawing compositions as finished drawings so much. It's uh, details. It's working out what this needs to look like or, you know, just making notations, that sort of thing, rather than finished drawings uh, as the final product. Well, I, I am curious about the nuts and bolts of things, too. What I don't even think I asked you Oh, that's this. where we were, yeah. Yeah, so so you paint sure. with you paint with oil. I like oil. I like the patina. Mm -hmm. The way it looks, mm -hmm. there's just something mm -hmm. about its surface quality that just, it looks beautiful. It's, yeah. yeah. But yeah. Uh, what, what do you paint yeah. on? Um, I actually paint on a product called Red Lion Polyflex. That's a Frederick's pot product, isn't it? Yeah, right. And for years, I just painted on it straight because it has a really monotonous texture and everybody hates it, or almost everybody hates it. But I like it because I get it in a roll and it's, and it's about as permanent a, a, a surface uh, as you can use, and and I like it, actually like its consistency, so there so there's no surprises in it. You know, like a, a bump all of a sudden that you where you want some detail. Right. But recently, I've been uh, experimenting. <laughs> there's that word again. <laughs> well, that's good. With a textured surface, so and it has it has a latex gesso on it. So I use a latex, liquitex gesso that I've, you know, gallons of it that I've had for 30 years. <laughs> and I'm using it again because I'm not preparing my own canvases, or I hadn't been. And then I've been putting a thick layer on it and creating a texture on the surface. So you mean like, like, like the, be an impasto type ridges and things like that? Right. The, yeah. Oh, yeah, but I, then I sand them down so that I don't want to have a lot of ridges. And so it, 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 I'd like a consistently inconsistent ground to paint on, you know. Uh, so then I I will take a sanding block and sand it down so it's almost flat again, but there still is some interest in the surface. And then I may go back because once you open it up with a, the surface with a sanding block, you'll get the paint absorption differently from, you know, by the millimeter. So then I go back over with a thin coat of Liquitex over the whole thing and just brush it on smoothly uh, and maybe even thin it just so that there's a, a, a thin layer a film over the whole surface so that the absorption is the same across the whole, the whole surface and the, you know, the, the slickness or the lack of it is consistent across the whole surface. And I just started doing that in the last couple of years. Oh. So, you know, it, it's just more experimentation and going, okay, well, oh, what if I did this? And so I tried it and I'm liking it. So my bigger paintings, I don't do it with the small paintings because it doesn't make any sense to me. And that's on the polyflex. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And I mount it with a uh, miracle muck to gator board because mm -hmm. I don't like stretch canvas. I don't want anything that's bouncing when I'm trying to stab it in <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with, a, with a brush. <laughs> I want it. I want it to stay where it is, so I can make the stab. And, and no trampoline painting. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't like stretch canvas. I really don't. So, um, so it's it's on a board. It's rigid. Stays where it's supposed to, and doesn't expand and contract. And neither does polyflex. Actually, uh, you know, it's polyester, so it doesn't. It just stays there. You know, and once you glue it down, it really stays here. And gator board is uh, is rigid. Is it, so it doesn't it doesn't expand, right? No. Uh -uh. Okay. Mm. They, you know, like linen absorbs water. So you got linen, and you go from a humid climate to uh, to here. We were talking about humidity earlier. Well, that's what happens when I take one of you, take a painting on stretch linen to Georgia, Sagsville. Mm. So. It's going to get baggy. Sorry about that. 
So you stretch it in Georgia, and then you, know, you put wedges in the corner, you bring it back to Colorado, and now you have cracks in your canvas. So in your paint film, so you know because it's contracted again. So uh, it's just easier to paint on something rigid, as far as I'm concerned. Easier to handle. Yeah, I've never seen the polyflex material by Fredericks before. It's boring, but they make they make several different textures. Yeah, they make a portrait grade, you know, that's real fine weave. And uh, I've never used the other ones other than just the, the the standard one because I didn't know they existed until I was searching for a roll of it once and. On online and um, you know, it's like, oh my yarn, look at that! And they make it in different widths. I get one that's about fifty six inches wide. And there's there's my there's my concession to being commercial artist as a as a painter. Yeah. If you paint something that's more than about four feet tall, you're probably not going to fit it into somebody's house with an eight foot ceiling. <laughs> yeah. So so I tend not to go over forty eight high or so or 50 uh and that's kind of the max and this canvas is uh, 56 inches wide so it fits the bill perfect do you ever consider just painting on a surface like a hardboard or the gator board itself or is it do you need to have that uh that linen or the polyflex canvas on? well there's an idea no i hadn't considered that uh polyflex uh, uh, you know one of the things that i do with the canvas is i wrap the edges too i I turn the, the polyflex over onto the backside and right. glue that down too. Uh, so that protects the edges because polyflex is really brittle. You can bang up the, the edges and take it out of the frame. Somebody wanted to change frames and drop it on the, you know, on the vice on the floor or something like that at a frame shop, you'd have a chip out of the corner or, or out of the side. So Out of the gator board? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The gator board is, is pretty darn fragile stuff on the edges. Years and years and years ago, everybody used to use masonite as a painting surface. And, uh, yeah, I, I did that for a while, but I, I didn't like doing that. I, I like canvas for some reason. I guess maybe because it's kind of traditional. Well, it's not kind of. It is. For yeah, sure. it is. It's a painting ground. So, Well, I imagine there's an archival side of it, too. If it's if the polyflax or, uh, you know, prime linen or whatever you use is attached to the gator board or a hardboard panel it can always be separated in the future and reset if there was a need to do that. Well, not, not with miracle month. They say, they say that that's true. You can't be reset. You can turn it over and remove it in an arduous process, Uh, but you're not going to separate the canvas from the gator board. I don't see that happening. Well, we'll just leave that for the conservators. That's that's another problem. Uh, that's that's where you know uh, everybody worries about after the darn things after your dead. You know what happens in a hundred years? And I'm going, <laughs> okay, I'm going to let them worry about it. There you, you go. Know, I'm not going to deliberately use low quality materials or anything that I don't care about. But it's just another rung in the insanity that I already have in my brain that I don't want to go to. So I, I just, you know, I'm using this good stuff. I have a good ground. I have a canvas that's that's basically indestructible. And um, I'm going to leave it at that, <laughs> which brings up go. a thought. <laughs> Once, <laughs> well, what's that thought? You know, everybody's putting on, you know, canvas or, or oil paint on, on linen canvas. Well, that's okay. I, you know, I don't know. I think it's kind of funny, but... just for the heck of it in the Autry show. <laughs> I put oil paint on indestructible uh, synthetic canvas. And they actually put that on the descriptions of the paintings on the walls and in the catalog. <laughs> did they? Yeah, they did. And I had more people wonder in the show and I had calls from artists wondering what that was. <laughs> 
And I, I was just doing it kind of as a nasty joke, you know, about all this <laughs> linen stuff, as yeah. if that mattered. Um, but, uh, you know, once it's, once it's, and it does matter, you know, linen is much better, apparently stronger, et cetera, than cotton. But if you mount it down, you know, and you put a good ground on it, it it's kind of like, you know, what's the difference here? Um, I, I don't know. That, that's a, this is thin ice, so I'm going to get off of it. So. Okay. <laughs> no more skating on that that side of the pond. Well, well you know, as you know, they say, you might as well dance if you're going to skate on thin ice and, and, or walk on thin ice. So. Well, there's so uh, many different yeah. opinions on it, I, I know, and I, but I'm always oh, curious gosh. about what people... Tools are fun to talk about. I, I, you know, sure. you know, I, my friends who are carpenters, they talk about their Makitas and their Milwaukee's and all that stuff. You know, it's, 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 it's not what gets the work done, but sometimes it's, it's, it's the fun part. It's one of the fun parts of it. Well, you know, it, it is what gets the work done for that particular person. Yeah. It's like, what kind of brushes do you use? Well, if, you know, I, I tend to use one kind of brush, worn out at this point. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I have to replace them every once in a while. But, you know, I thought I would never, I thought sand brushes, how, what, who would want to make something so smooth or what? Well, I went with Jim Reynolds and a couple, bunch of us, I don't know, four or five of us all got together and Jim was kind of doing a little workshop kind of thing that Matt Smith put together, thankfully. And, and Jim and I got along great. You know, we, we, uh, we're both old guys. But uh, and he was using a fan brush to take the uh, the edge off the texture of, of of something that he'd been working on, so that when he painted into it the next day or three or four days later, it wouldn't have all his bumps to contend with if it was a textured passage. And I went, well, that's a great idea. And so I actually bought a fan brush, and then I bought another one, and. Um, I found that if I have a a dark, flattish panel of paint with a lot of texture and say it's a, the face of a rock or something, which is generally where I wind up using it a little bit, and there's too much texture in it, but I want to pile on the paint, and I can come back the next day with a fan brush and just lightly go over it and take the ridges down a little bit and still maintain the texture and it gives a certain flatness hmm. to the surface. And it's and I'm going, boy, what a discovery. I'm sure glad I went, you know, we got together and did that. And because I was just like, oh, no, I'm not using a fan brush. <laughs> so <laughs> look uh, at all the things you learn when you open your mind a little bit. So, so, um, so, so Bob Ross wasn't too far off then. <laughs> I don't know. I've never watched one of those. I've seen little bits and stuff, but uh, no, I, I haven't watched the whole episode. So. Yeah. yeah. I am curious about something. Your painting dimensions don't follow. I don't want to use the word the norm, but that's what it is. You'll, you'll see like 16 by 20, 20 by 24. This painting that you were talking about, the Scrub Jays breakfast menu is 32 by 37. I want to know the rationale behind those different uh, dimensions. Well, uh, it it actually started when I was in a gallery in San Francisco early on, and and I got a painting back from them that had a different frame on it than I put on it. Uh oh. And and I wondered about that to them, and they said, "Well, the the, uh, the the person that bought the other painting liked that frame better, and so we just switched frames." And I went, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> was it your painting that they sold and swapped out? No, no, it was the other one. Oh, they, my goodness. The person goodness. that wanted the other painted liked my frame better. Oh, no. And so they switched the frame. And then I found out later that it was not an uncommon practice at the time. I don't know if that still happens or not. And so I, um, I thought... Well, I know one way to fix that. If um, maybe if I did a nineteen by twenty four, they go. wouldn't. They would. Be, they would find out that it didn't work. Um, and in fact, <laughs> I have uh, a collector who bought a piece once and didn't 
didn't care for the frame that I put on it. He was going to put a much more expensive frame on it, but he didn't tell me. He told me about it later, of course, but because he's a really funny guy and, and just generous as can be. And, and uh, he said, so I ordered a frame and it came and uh, I put your painting in it and there was an inch of white space at the top. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. He said, I should have known. So he actually should have known. He ordered yeah. another frame for it, which was fine. But he said, I thought it, was, it would be a 30 by 40. And it was a 29 by 40. <laughs> 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 or one of the dimensions was off. I don't remember. what. It, maybe it was a 30 by 39. I think that's what it was. Actually. Oh, okay. So, uh, so it, 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 uh, yeah. Yeah. And so that's, and I also just, you know, as a way to keep my interest up, I could do things like 32, 23, just, you know, doing an oxymoron or, I mean, a, a palindrome or, you know, just yeah. two, four, 24 by, th by 35, you know, or 34, 20, 24, 35. I, I just do it. I don't know why, just because it's me. And I'm difficult. No, that that sums it up. So. <laughs> I just, just for fun. So. Yeah. Well, I, those traditional sizes, eight by 10, 16 by 20, 11 by 14, that all came from photography because of the, the negative sizes uh, that they were using and they oh. were maximizing their, their enlargements. That didn't make it, make yeah. it right well, I, for paintings, right? Yeah. I still, I still, do those things. I use eight by tens and 12 by 16. That's what fits in my box and 12 by 18 sure. and 24, things, things like that once in a while, but it's not my general practice. I, wow. uh, um, yeah, well, those, those small ones are because they fit in my, bo my boxes that I put the panels into, but the bigger stuff, I just kind of go all over the place, but, um, and it's just more interesting for me. So I forgot to ask you when you were talking about the scrub Jays breakfast menu pa painting, that that one's is that one going to the pre West? Is that your pre West entry? Yeah, that's one of them. Yeah. Are they going to do it in person this year, or is it going to be a virtual? How how are they going to do that? Oh boy! Well, that's supposedly they're going to do it in person. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that is so up in the air that they rescheduled it from June to September. Yeah. But they're actually opening the the museum all set up on August 1st. So they're going to allow people to to kind of uh, come in at their own pace. And I think you have to make a reservation or they're only going to allow a certain number of people in the museum at one point at one time. So they're hoping that, I, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is the thinking that they will have collectors come in whenever they're in town or, or whatever to see what's there so they know what they would like to buy to add to their collections when the show and sale actually starts. And that won't be until September 5th or so. I've forgotten the date. Ah, I, so I don't bad, know it either. Yeah. It's, it's, well, it's too many, too many things on the calendar. That's part of the problem. So, well, and they're all moving like, around. <laughs> well, and yeah, they're moving around, and you know, it's like for me, it's was I supposed to start lettuce this week? So, <laughs> <laughs> are you? <laughs> Imp Im important things like that. No, yeah. I started it last week, and they're up. So, <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yeah. What's your What's so, your other entry into Pre to West? Uh, there's two others. One's a uh, 16 by 12 uh, water lily piece, just looking down into my pond. Uh, they're coming back after the I had to drain the pond to get at the leaks in the liner. And the other one is 2233. Oh well. Wow. <laughs> speaking speaking of sizes, and it's of uh, it's on my uh, Facebook page. It's on the um, Facebook. Okay, I'll I'll check it out. Yeah. And uh, I'm pretty sure it's on my website, but I'm not sure if I've asked my daughter to put it on or not. Yeah, but it's, uh, yeah. it's a fall a fall piece with uh, it's a big yellow painting with some water in it and some trees. Let me see if I can find it right. People have actually had more responses to that one than I did to the, oh, to the subject piece. I know which one. Okay, Solar Collectors. Yep, that one. Oh, wow. So there you go. That is wow. Okay. 
Excellent. They're Excellent. different. <laughs> Lynn, your your titles are are wonderful. I they're like oh, thanks. They're like little pieces of poetry or 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 add to the to the story just a little bit. I like that. That's funny. Because, you know, Bill Anton once said, you know, that you have to write a description for your paintings when they go into a show. He said, you know, you really ought to put those into a, a small book or something like that. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I, well, I just have fun with them. You know, it, it's really funny because I brought that from my time at Art Center. I had a, a graphic design teacher who said, if you can write, you're going to be one step ahead of the other guy who just does graphic design. So he insisted that you come up with, again, kind of concept ideas, things for for you know, to to keep that in mind when you're coming up with your designs, your graphic designs and so forth, and writing headlines. And all I'm doing is sitting in front of that stuff, sometimes for days, trying to figure out what I want to call pain, just because it's part of the fun for me. You know, trying to help people relate to them in a different way. And you know, like, uh, what was it that lost in space? I had so many people say, yeah, I get it. You know, because it was a double entendre. Sure. You know, it, and it, and that is so much fun for me. So it's just another way of exercising your brain. You know, it describes the painting. Yeah. We're lost in space in in the middle of Wyoming somewhere. Right. Plus, you know, it's that reaching cloud and, you know, whatever. You know, it's oh, it was wonderful. Out, it was know. great. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, it's funny because Ralph, Ralph Oberg and I were, were driving down the road and I asked him to stop. And when we got up there, because I wanted it, it, you know, around the hook there in the bottom of the painting, there's actually a road in it. And uh, took all that stuff out and completely redid the foreground. And, yeah, I, I, you know, never mind. It, it's it's a different painting than the, than the reference. And and he, and he wrote, I put that in the, on the Facebook thing, and he, and he wrote back and he said, were we lost? <laughs> so... <laughs> And I went, well, you know, we've, we've been out there before where we almost have been lost. <laughs> that was pretty fun. So. I like that you give thought to the titles. I, there's nothing <laughs> I that disappoints me more than see a painting or a photograph or a work of art titled Untitled. That just drives me nuts. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, Jim Reynolds, again, Jim was a good soul. He... He was asked when he was doing pretty well stuff to uh, to to come up with a, with the description of the painting, and his response to the director or not to the director but the publications person at the time, and he told me about this, and I, it was so much fun. He said, "Well, wait a minute. We don't ask authors to illustrate their books. How come we got to come up with writing to you know? And it is a visual thing, you know. <laughs> they had to come up with the description." I thought that was what they were supposed no, the to artist, do. No, the artists do. The artists do. Oh, wow. And then they were asking him to come up with the description of the painting, you know, just a comment about it. And and I've always done it anyhow. Yeah. And, uh, and I never gave it a second thought, but he didn't like to do it. So he said, you know, why do we have to, uh, why do we have to write something about a painting when why doesn't an, uh, an author have to illustrate their own books? or their own articles. And, and um, so he, he wouldn't do it. So they came up with something for him, which he also wasn't all that pleased about. <laughs> <laughs> he must have been quite so, a character. I, I, oh, he was good. Yeah. I, want to think, I hope we all are, but it makes, us, it's, it makes us different as artists. So being characters, just knowing who you are. It's, it's like a good Western movie, right? If they have a good cast, mm -hmm. good characters. You're enthralled for the whole two hours, right? Yep. Here's the script. Do something with it. Yeah. yeah. So I have an idea of what I want you to do, but if you can stay within these boundaries, you know, it's, it's like you know, it's like the show. Um, you wouldn't put, uh, you know, France. I mean, uh, um, France Klein abstract into the Pre West. No, as I said, so you know, there's some parameters. Not that it's not good or excellent or amazing, 
uh, it's just not a fit. And uh, so when, you know, sometimes parties complain about, you know, they got to kind of get into this sort of slot and it's their show. You know, you don't want to do it. Fine. Uh, a lot of things like that in life. Oh, they're right. Sure. Yeah. The difference between the, the operating systems for PCs and Macs. Yeah. You know? So, Lynn, I've, 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 I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me on the show. Oh, sure. This is enjoyable for me. I like talking with you, so. Oh, so. well, thank you. Well, the, the pleasure is mine. I'm, 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 well. I'm able to get insight into a world that I really had no experience with. And I'm just, I'm just drinking it in. I'm just drinking it in. And so I, I deeply appreciate uh, you and the others that have so kindly done this. It just means a lot to me. I'm truly grateful to Lynch Mill for taking the time to speak with us again. If you haven't bought his book, Lynch Mill, An Authentic Nature, please look into it. It's a beautiful introduction to his work. It's an inspiring volume, and you really should get a copy of it before it's no longer available. I do have a link to it in the show notes and the blog post for this episode. So what did you think of the lessons that Lynn Schmill shared with us today? What were some of your favorites? If you'd like to let us know, all you have to do is go to carlson.tv, click on the contact tab and fill out the information there, and uh, let me know. And I'll share it possibly in a future episode of The Artful Painter. Now, one of my favorites was this idea of doing a mental reset, forcing yourself to to look at familiar things as if you were seeing it for the first time. So that's a good reminder. Uh, Sometimes uh, I can take things for granted. And that's a good way to get out of that mode and seeing things with fresh eyes. Also, I like the idea of not being afraid to experiment and try new things in order to learn new things about painting. Of course, there were many others. Uh, I'll have to go back and listen to this episode again (laughs) so that I can uh, uh, jot down a few more notes of things that I intend to apply as I develop as a a painter. Before we close out the show, I do want to share one little bit of uh, feedback here. This comes from Peter. He says, uh, well, let me give you a little backgrounder to his brief message. Uh, Many of you listen to my podcast. You listen to it on YouTube, uh, which just amazes me. I'm I'm really happy that you do. YouTube has turned out to be a great way to to consume this podcast. So I appreciate all those that do. But anyway, he discovered The Artful Painter through YouTube. So uh, this is what he says. He says, my first listen to your podcast via YouTube was this morning. A great interview with Brian Rutenberg. Thank you. Look forward to listening to many more that you have posted. Gratitude. Well, Peter, thank you so much. I'm glad you found the podcast. Brian Rutenberg is one of those, uh, well, he is he's truly an interesting artist. Uh, that was a great conversation I had with him a couple of years ago. So thank you for uh, finding us and be sure to share Uh, the podcast with others that may not know about it. Now I get to one of my favorite sections, my associate producers. These are people who financially support the Artful Painter with their generous donations. And I have a new associate producer to welcome to my associate production crew. That is Sandra Shook. Yes, she is now an associate producer. So these are my current list of associate producers or or people who basically uh, donate to the uh, the podcast. Uh, Alan Bloom, Jeffrey Eikhoff, Richard Husband, Brent Kimber, Jonathan McPhillips, Jim McVicker, Margaret Miller, Debbie Mueller, Sandra Shook, Frank Wash, and Colleen White. Thank you so very much. Now, you will not want to miss the next episode of The Artful Painter. It will feature one of my favorite artists, Bill Anton. I've been waiting to do this uh, interview uh, for a long time. I've been wanting to do it for a long time, and now it's imminent. I'm almost ready to share it with you. It's an extraordinary conversation with, in my opinion, one of the finest Western artists. Look for it in your favorite podcast listening app 
It should show up in the podcast feeds and on YouTube sometime next week. Thank you for listening to this edition of The Artful Painter. I'll see you in the next episode.